running, we've enjoyed the great good fortune to have Derek Walker visit us as our professor of poetry. I want to thank everyone who's made this possible, this, these marvelous high points of our year, especially Maria Cristina from my family and Penny Woodard, and above all, Sigrid Nam, whom it's wonderful to see here again. Derek's visits have become a time of festival and exciting exchange, a stimulus to us all to recalibrate our priorities and put writing and reading and thinking about literature first and foremost. Because Derek, through his writings, his beautiful rum and molasses bass voice, and his witty, formidable, trenchant personality, never allows laxity when it comes to words and their meanings, their patterns, their music. Derek is currently rehearsing his play Pantomime, which is opening this week here at the Lakeside. He will be talking about it, and amongst other things, with Glyn Maxwell. The play is a tensely choreographed comedy that weaves out of a tight duologue, a multiple web of ideas about history and psychology, specific to the colonial conflicts in the Caribbean in the past, but acutely illuminating of the situation in the world far more widely than today. It is funny, it is dark, and it has, like much of Derek's work, shafts of such insight that the effect gives hope, the hope that literature can press out acts of mimesis. It's a great understatement to say that Derek has raised the game for creative writing here at Essex and made us internationally known. Glyn Maxwell, whom we're so happy to have managed to attach to our department and to our creative writing team here, was one of Derek's former students on the drama course. Derek taught for many years at Boston University. Like Derek, Glynn is a virtuoso and polymorphous and prodigiously energetic writer for the stage and the page, who lays emphasis on prosody, meter, and the primacy of poetry in all its forms, from lyric to choral song to dramatic blank verse. His most recent collection is called 1,000 Nights and Counting, selected poems, and he's just finished a handbook to poetry, succinctly called On Poetry, which is coming out next month <coughs> with the on books. I'm hoping that some of these books are going to be uh, there for you uh, to buy and for them to sign later. Lynn's also created uh, for many, many, many plays, including Liberty, which is its, explores the French Revolution and was produced at the Globe in 2008. And recently, and I had the good luck to see this in Oxford, a, ver a variation on two plays by Euripides, Hecuba and the Trojan Women. Entitled After Troy, it reveals how acutely contemporary the themes of Greek tragedy remain and how deeply the tragedians explored the consequences of war for the state and the individual. He is teaching novel writing here, among other things, because he's also a comic novelist, sometimes combining all his skills and producing dramatic fiction in verse. <laughs> I don't want to take more time, but I recently read a highly original and inspiring study called The Invention of Literature by a French classicist, Florence Dupont. She points out an aspect of the history of literature that is blindingly obvious once she's drawn attention to it. And that is that most literature, before the habit of silent reading became widespread, was written to be performed. The oral and the written aren't in collision. They aren't distinct. They are joined by the presence of the interpreter, the living interpreter. Writing things down and keeping them in that form was a practice identified with the logos, or the permanent enshrinement of law or accounts in the archive. But the works of imagination, the poetry, the plays, elegies, love songs, are not silent and enclosed and still. They are to be voiced and performed because, and this is the interesting part, literature is the place where we want life to be made active. Vitality and presence, brought about by words, are what matters. Anyway, anyhow, we now have two writers who know what that means and have magnificently given us of their voices and I will perform for us now. Please welcome Derek Walcott and Glenn Max. Song of the Bylaws. Never have met me, know me well, 
Tell all the world there was little to tell. Say I was heavenly, say I was hell. Harry me over the blasted moors, but come my way, go yours. Never have touched me, take me apart. Trundle me through my town in a cart. Figure me out with the aid of a chart. Finally add to the feeble applause, and come my way, go yours. Never have read me, look at me now. Get why I'm doing it, don't get how. Other way round, have a rest, have a row. Have skirmishes with me, have wars. Oh, come my way, go yours. Never have left me, never come back. Mourn me in miniskirts, date me in black. Undress as I dress when I unpack pack. Yet pause for eternity on all fours to come my way, go yours. Never have met me, never do. Never be mine, never even be you. Approach from a point it's impossible to at a time you don't have. And by these bylaws, come my way, go yours. I was... Uh, not sure how to start the, this session, so I asked Derek how, because he's my, been my teacher for about half a century, and uh, he said, read a couple of poems. So uh, I felt it was, I felt the pressure to, to explain that that was Derek's idea. <laughs> 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 um, uh, um, so I'm just going to read a s little uh, sonnet here, um, which is about uh, trying to uh, defeat the natural laws of uh, success in love by trying to fool time by pretending it's not the present. <coughs> He's my teacher, I'm just explaining in case you thought that was too. Anything but the case, do me my elegy now, or I'll scrawl the thing I scrawl as you're going, or screw in a ball when you're gone. Or you and I write unaware in each other's tongue that you or I ever set foot, or do what our son and or little daughter got done. Got our brilliant names, pricily grooved in marble by one skilled in times of loss. Dream iridescent dreams, it's that first Saturday. Let this hour be filled with anything but the case, so that time, the clerk, goes panting in horror from gremlin to error to glitch, and his screen is stripes, and he knows he saved his work in one of a billion files, but fuck knows which, and he lets us alone. Or at worst, as we tiptoe by, feels we're familiar, can't for the world say why. Um, when I was Derek's student in Boston University in 1887-88, I think that's right, uh, he said to me, um, in about 10 years' time, you'll be sitting here, i.e. in a position on the other side of the desk. And uh, he was almost exactly right, although it was somewhere else, that it was still that side of a desk, and I was teaching like he, he'd taught me. Um, uh, well, now, for the first time, and probably only for these two weeks, um, uh, we're in the same English department. Um, this won't be for very long, and it probably won't be again after today. Um, but uh, just in case, Derek, I brought some marking, because I felt that you weren't <laughs> <coughs> exactly pulling your weight in a department. And this may be the only time I get a chance to you know, share that with you. Um, <laughs> Perhaps as you, you, you were my teacher and, and uh, uh, I'm teaching now years later here um, and, uh, and you're here to, to teach the workshops you're doing, perhaps we start by just talking a little bit about teaching, um, about uh, what it sort of meant to you and if that's changed at all, if it's sort of evolved. Um, what's the... I, I know you spoke... Uh, maybe I shouldn't say, but you've spoken very approvingly of the people you're teaching here and you also talked about the people you taught at Edmund in Edmonton, Canada, very uh, uh, approvingly. What is it about a young uh, poet or a, you know, that, 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 that you want to be able to teach? Um, I think one thing we better clear up is that when Glenn mentions me, my teaching him, I don't want people to get the impression that he's, you know, like a Chardin painting, he's there and I'm here, and I'm saying this metaphor, yes, it wasn't like that. You missed the joke. I'm saying mm -hmm. I didn't explain line by line what he was doing as a poet. He came to Boston as a full-fledged poet, a young man, a kind of young Rambo maybe, but that's not nice to say to him. So anyway, he was a full-fledged poet, someone who knew how to use meter and rhyme and stuff like that. So I don't want to have the wrong impression given. Um, what is unique about Glenn's poetry for me is that he works out of that area 
that is not defined in poetry. It's not defined in the criticism of poetry. It is in the territory of maybe and perhaps and so what and what is this? In mystification and curiosity. And he stays in that territory that is, he's made peculiarly his. And so a Maxwell poem is one you don't quite get, but there's something, but it's not in the sense that in Ashbury's poems, you don't get it because you're too dumb. But <laughs> in his case, um, it's like, I would like to completely utter something, but if I utter it completely, it would be false. So there's hesitancy and tremor in his poetry, and that's the most attractive thing about it. So let's clear up that mystery. Um, <clears throat> the older I get in the profession, the more I love it. Uh, I get very, very happy and tearful in a sense sometimes when I see young poets continuing to write poetry and falling in love with the craft and trying to express it. I had a beautiful class in Edmonton this year and I got them to, as I always do, got them to recite poetry. And there's nothing more moving to me than to hear a group of young voices reciting some of the great dead poets like Edward Thomas or Wilfred Owen or anyone. Uh, because what it does is it revalidates poetry in the young. And you know, you can die because now it's continuing in terms of the immortality of the craft. And when you hear it recited with the passion that young people have, with the belief that, are, that they have, then it's very, very moving for that to happen. I have a job to do, though. I have to read a poem to be taped. Somebody hit it. Where is it? Oh, there. <clears throat> I wrote this poem many, many years ago when I was beginning as a poet. And it came from a sermon that I got in the Methodist Church about John on Patmos. There's a famous painting by Poussin. When I was a young poet, I modeled myself very deliberately on other poems because I believed that what art was was imitation, that we learned from our predecessors that the votive attitude we have to the craft is what perpetuates it. So this poem is modeled on Gerard Manley Hopkins' poem about Oxford, and you can even hear it in the rhymes at the end. Hounded, surrounded, rounded, and dead, cheek wear, bleak air, Greek there, speak here, cities, prettiers, litters, surrounded, ditties, leaping air, sleeping here, John did, Brown dead. As John to Patmos, among the rocks and the blue live air, hounded his heart to peace. As here, surrounded by the strewn silver and waves, the woods crude here, the rounded breasts of the milky bays, palms, flocks, the green and dead leaves, the sun's brass coin on my cheek, where canoes brace the sun's strength. As John in that bleak air, so am I welcomed richer by these blue scapes Greek there. So I shall voyage no more from home. May I speak here? This island is heaven, away from the dust-blown blood of cities. See the curve of bay, watch the straggling flower. Pretty is the winged sound of trees, the sparse powdered sky when lit is the night. For beauty has surrounded its black children and freed them of homeless ditties. As John to Patmos in each love leaping air, O oh, slave soldier, worker under red trees sleeping, hear what I swear now as John did, 
to praise love long living and the brown dead. So what is your question? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> answered, of course. In, in the um, first ten minutes, you, you already mentioned four or five uh, English poets, and I suppose that takes me on to the question of um, your... Uh, I think, thinking of England and I'm thinking of Italy, two countries in Europe where you've spent a lot of time over the years, um, and thinking w w and also written about, w w what is the situation when you... you, you you, you have this conception of them that is literary um, before you see them. As a, as a young man, you would have had a literary conception of England and, and of Italy. And then after all these years, uh, after a number of years, you come and you experience the place, and yet that, I'm, I'm sure that never leaves you, that sense of the light, that sense of uh, uh, the literature. Uh, I mean, w w since I've been here in the last few days, you talked about um, you know, Constable and, and the, 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 the sort of idealized beauty of England at the same time when we drive up under the podium in the rain, you're, you're looking at now, <laughs> you're looking at Essex now and so on. And well, uh, how, how does that sort of work in terms of the work, the, 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 the sense of a place in the, in the past and then the reali reality of it? Um, I don't know if, if anyone has measured the intensity or depth of belief that we have when we first come to literature and how we revere it and believe it and think that anything real really contradicts it. Um, if we want to see a landscape projected, not in memory, but as in anticipation, that landscape exists a stronger reality than when we arrive at the real landscape. What we arrive at is either a contradiction or a confirmation of what we believe England is like or Italy is like. I didn't want to go to Italy or to Europe for a long time when I was younger because I didn't want to be thrown by it. Um, I thought if I go there, I'm finished because there's going to be too much that I'm going to try to describe and I'm going to be converted into some kind of West Indian Italian poet or even Italian poet or some uh, ar you know, arrogant West Indian poet who's trying to reject what is beautiful. All right, so I get to Italy and now years later, I'm a kind of convert and I hated those people who would tell you about Italy. You know, you, you have to see Italy. Why do I have to see Italy? I live in the Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my attitude. It was very, very belligerent. You know, I don't tell me about the marbles and Florence and all of that. No, I'm not a convert. It's not that I have suddenly embraced um, Italy and all its art and so on. It's that I have come there and I have arrived at it on my own. It's not because I've read or, paint, or seen the paintings of X or Y that necessarily confirms what I see. It is a genuine conversion of looking at the Italian landscape and saying, Jesus, this is very beautiful, but separately from the history of its being beautiful. So that um, I come from probably some of the most beautiful country in the world, from the Caribbean. I get up in the morning and I am greeted by an astonishing view, something that should be in a bad movie. Uh, I look at it and it's there and it's a confirmation of delight and joy. And what I measure sometimes is how can such a landscape that produces such beauty, how could that have caused so much pain? So much suffering is a part of that landscape. So the duality exists in terms of looking at the beauty of the landscape and knowing the horror that existed in Caribbean history with indenture and slavery and so forth. Um, I'm just saying that I arrived at love of Italy by myself and not by tradition. Yeah. Well, uh, when, when I first arrived in St. Lucia um, at your place years ago, um, having grown up in mid Hertfordshire in a new town, my, I wasn't so much um, 
uh, it wasn't so much as your reaction to Italy as like, uh, I, 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 I can't embrace all this, I don't want to try and do all that. It was more like, I'll just be quiet about this. <laughs> and, and in fact, <laughs> Derek uh, you know, was, was as much a friend as a teacher by then, and because you, he pre you protected me. You, uh, you uh, uh, started telling me the names of all the flowers and the trees, but you gave me wrong names, so that if I tried to do it, I'd screw up. And, <laughs> and you were protecting me from doing that fake uh, Englishman in, in the Caribbean. So, yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, obviously, um, home and exile are uh, um, enduring themes in the work. Now, uh, we've had conversations like this in New York when you were still based there, and now you're based back in St. Lucia, although you still travel a lot. Um, what alters in terms of the um, articulation of the beauty around you um, between sort of living in Boston and looking back on it um, to actually being, as you say, waking up with it around you every morning. And uh, does it does it alter? Do you um, does it alter the the nature of how you write it? Does it alter it formally? More and more, year by year, I'm deeply convinced of the reality of poetry not of the romantic aspect of it, not the literary aspect. Uh, I was being driven the other day through a very beautiful country. People know it, Constable country. And it was a, a, a trip that provoked that line from Larkin, which is very painful to say. I'm a weeper, you know, I might suddenly burst into tears, so look out. Um, but to see the line, and that would be England gone. Yeah. 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 And that's nearly 40 what years. What I'm years. saying is that the reality of the line of Larkin is greater than reality, than the real reality. And to think of what, <coughs> what it meant in the real context of where I want, was at the time I'm saying it. It's just, um, that's what I think about, about the reality of poetry. Yeah. 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 Quotation was there. Um, I don't know how to develop that, but that's what I mean. Well, yeah, no, just thinking about Larkin, how that, the, he regarded that as England gone, what's that, 50, 60 years ago now, probably wrote that. Yeah. yeah, it's just a bit scary <laughs> what, to think what Larkin would have said now. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, 50 years, 50, 60 oh, years old? It, it, I would have thought he would have written that in the 50s, maybe. Yeah. Oh. I mean, most of the best of Larkin is. Yeah. That's funny that that is a commissioned poem. It's not, you know, he, he, it was a commissioned poem that he wrote that took it. It shows you what it means about the poet's job. You know, somebody says, write a poem about what's, what's happening to England, and he comes up with these wonderful lines because he means them and they hurt him, you know. But yeah. the fact is, it's a commissioned poem. It's something a poem a poet do, does to order, you know, which is magnificent. Thomas Hardy does the same thing with the Titanic, to be topical. Um, and his poem about the Titanic looks better than James Cameron's film. I mean, in terms of, <laughs> in terms of the accuracy, in terms of poetry getting it, he was just trying to think of what it would look like down yeah. there, you know, a, a couple of weeks after it happened. Yeah. Uh, do you, you want to read a little from White Regrets? Sure. Yeah. It is old Europe in her voice. The cliches rise like a flutter of starlings from the wet cobbles. The ears yaw like yachts on the odor. The eyes of the lindens tremble and close. Bells bless the railed park where veterans hunch on benches and widows shoo the goose stepping pigeons. In the green canal, ducks stare. Its stench is oddly comforting. The sweet reek of moss, two swans rehearse some opera. In her voice, silent bicycles glide along paths. We have great woods in Belgium, while a landscape of headless sticks 
is still all there is of bare mountain. Her fast words float over the sparkling Susquehanna. Towns I cannot pronounce speckle her senses. The Europe spite with spires and russet nouns glimpsed between birches. She grows more beautiful the more she remembers. Her husband at attention in his white doctor's tunic delivered from the evil of Stalingrad and Riga. Words was not worth mention. All day I wish I was at Kazma passing incongruous cactus which grows in the north in the chasm deep ruts of the dry season with the thunderous white horses that dissolve in froth and the bush that mimics them with white cotton to the strengthening smell of cake from the bright Atlantic. As the road ruts level and you come upon a view that dissolves into pure description, a bay whose arc limits of an infinite Africa. The trade wind tirelessly frests the water, combers along and the swells heave with weed that smells, a smell nearly rotten but tolerable soon. Light hurls its nets over the white caps and seagulls grieve over some common but irreplaceable loss while a high disdainful frigate bird, a ciseau, Sides in the slides in the clouds, then is lost with the forgotten caravels, privateers, and other frigates, with the changing sails of the sky, and a sea so deep it has lost its stuttering memory of our hates. So the world is waiting for Obama, my barber said, and the old fences in the village street and the flowers brimming over the rusted zinc fences all acquired a sheen like a visible sigh and indoors in the small barber shop, an election poster joined another showing all the various hairstyles available to his young black clients that cost the same no matter who you were, president of the US. Head smooth as a bowling ball, my barber smiles. Is that a Muslim or African name, Obama? Benign and gentle with his swift snipping scissors. I wish him luck, and luck waits in each gable shadowed street that leads to the beach. Polo loves politics, once in the glass there were photos of Malcolm, King, Garvey, Pres Fred Frederick Douglass frowning in the breadfruit window. Also, the yapping dogs, the hoses, the church in Alabama. Polo is young, black, bald, under his baseball cap, but more than a barber, he is delicate, adept. And when I leave his throne, shake shorn hair from my lap, I feel changed like an election promise that is kept. Elegy for M.A. Césaire. I sent you in Martinique, Maitre, the unfolding letter of a sail, a letter beyond the lines of blindingly white breakers of lace-laden surpluses and congregational shale. I did not send any letter, though it flared on the wind. Your island is always in the haze of my mind, with the blown about seabirds in the creole clatter of vowels met among makers, whom the reef recites when the copper sea almonds blaze, beacons to distant Dakar and the dolphin's acres. This page is a cloud between whose fraying edges a headland with mountains appears brokenly, then is hidden again until what emerges from this now cloudless blue is a grooved sea 
and the whole self-naming island, its opal verges, its shadow plunged, plunged valley, and a coiled road threading the fishing villages. The white silent surges of comas along the coast where a line of gulls has arrowed into the widening harbor of a town with no noise, its streets growing closer like print you can now read. Two cruise ships, schooners, a tug, ancestral canoes, as a cloud slowly covers the page and it goes white again and the book comes to a close. The hulls of white yachts riding the orange water of the marina at dusk, and under their bow spreads the chuckle of the chain in the stained sea. Try to get them before green light winks from the mast, the forecastle blazes with glare, while dusk hangs in suspension with cross trees and ropes and lilac livid sky with its bare stein of cloud froth touched by the sun as stars come up to watch the evening die. In this orange hour, the light reads like Dante, three lines at a time, their symmetrical tension, quiet bars rippling from the paradiso as a dinghy writes lines made by the scanty meter of its oar strokes and we, so mesmerized, can hardly talk. Happier than any man now is the man who sits drinking wine with his lifelong companion under the winking stars and the steady arc lamps at the end of the pier. What, you're gonna be Superman at 77? Got your weight down? Okay, you've lost seven pounds. But what you've also lost is belief in heaven, as dear friends die. Still making his rounds, the postman, the cipher, Basil, whatever you call him, a cyclist silently, silently exercising on Sunday down a shade-striped avenue of Casarina with boasts of foam on the breakwater's wall. I'm sure everyone knows it will happen one day. The yachts nodding agreement in all the marinas the blackbirds in frock coats, the frogs staccato him, seven less pounds and you'll need a slimmer coffin. You suffer from a furious itch that raises welts on your neck and forearms. And so now you swim early in the morning to avoid the sun. Fear melts before daylight's beauty, despite all that coughing. Also in Italy, I'd never seen anything quite like it. Those squares of harvested wheat, panels of a green crop, maybe corn, tilled hills in rolling light, dotted with olive and the cypress that I love. A bleached riverbed and fields of always surprising sunflowers around Urbino, like nothing I had read. Small hills gently declining, then gently rising. And above the rushing asphalt, the window said, you have seen Umbria, admired Tuscany, and gaped at the width of the harbor at Genoa. Now I show you an open secret. Do you know any landscape as lo lovely as this? Do you know a drive as blessed as this one? I said, Monterey. We stopped the car to, to take in the light the breakers, juniper, pine, and the unfolding skies of the coast. If the grain flung by the sower in the card brings such astonishment, such a sure harvest, I have seen them with my own eyes. There's a couple of lines in, I think it's the first poem in White Egrets, and you say, accept it all with level sentences, with sculpted settlement that sets each stanza. 
that made me think about um, the forms you worked in, going all the way back to the um, to the, the, your first poems, um, because there there were certain formal. Um, uh, there was a lot of formality in the early days. There were the strong pentameters and tetrameters, and there was terzarima and all sorts of things, and sonnets and so on. Um, whereas uh, what you described there in those lines in White Egrets is a, a fairly constant sort of, um, I, d I don't really call f use prosody anymore, I don't really believe in it, but it's like a sort of extended uh, pentameter. Um, it sort of rises and falls. And it, j it's, it seems you, you've, you've, you are happy with a, a kind of, with that line, particularly happy with that line, and uh, you don't vary it, well, you vary it infinitely, but you don't technically um, halve it or truncate it, and you don't work in short stanzas anymore. And as a sort of obsessive, um, uh, someone obsessively interested in form, I'm curious uh, how, you, how you see the sort of developments through, the, through your career, through your, I, don't, I hate the word career as well, for your life as a poet. You work in one form for a while, some period, period in your life, and then you say, I'm never going to write, write uh, short, you know, staccato stanzas again, ever. I'm not attracted to them. And then the next book you do is that. <laughs> uh, so, because of the poetry keeps insisting on a shape. I think one of the things that you have to try to teach young poets is joy in form in the form itself. If you don't have that delight, write prose. Not that it doesn't bring you the same kind of joy, maybe, but the joy that is brought to poet by poetry is an elation that has to do with symmetry, the joy of seeing a thing rhyme itself. I mean, a great deal of poetry is panic. You start on the left-hand side and you're going fine. Okay, I'm going to get to the other side and that's, that's going to be okay. I'll just write cha-cha-cha-cha. Here comes a rhyme, duck. <laughs> that's really what happens. Because you, you, know, you write a line and it's terrific. And then you say, Jesus, I'm halfway through the second line, but I have a rhyme coming. What do I do? Panic. You know, and then you do it. So you write in half rhyme. You cheat. <laughs> or you don't rhyme. Um, every poem rhymes even blank verse, even because what is happening, the instinct of the couplet lies in the second line of the stanza that you're writing. It's there. It may be repressed, it may be changed, it may be made dissonant, but that's what's there. The line, the, the, rhyme, the, the word that's coming. And how you handle it is how literature is varied. How Wilfred Owen may handle it, or Ted Hughes may handle it, or some other poet may do it. Um, so that what happens is that sometimes half rhyme can be more skillful, as Wilfred Owen should sometimes, than the regular, regular rhyme. The technical excitement that exists in doing a poem is very little around these days because you're working um, symmetrical verse, sure, I mean, or stressed verse, but it does not have the joy that is there in fulfilling making the rhyme work. It doesn't have to rhyme. It could be buried instinct that is there in the stanza. But that is the joy in, in, in verse. Um, and a great deal of disaster has been done by telling younger poets, you know, you have to be free, you have to express yourself. Children delight in discipline, the proper discipline. They like, you know, the thing you should always do is, if somebody's child, you know, some young kid, very young, brings you a drawing, and you say, what's that, Bobby? That's a train. You say, Jesus Christ, this is not a train. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't look like a train, Bobby. <laughs> you know? So you, you're not shattering his faith. You're just telling him, if you're going to be an artist, you better be a little more accurate. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's the sadist I am teaching. Yeah, that, 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 that rang a bell with me, that did. Oh, oh. <laughs> what? It rang a bell with me. <laughs> I remember bringing a poem to Derek once. Um, it was about 40 lines long. This is in Boston. And uh, um, I think you'd, you'd, t you told us to memorize the, the Dylan Thomas, 24 years remind the tears of my eyes. So I thought it was about the right age, had a birthday coming up. So I wrote a poem 
you know, I had this much to say at 24, you know. Uh, and I took it to Derek and then he looked at this phrase, um, which I think I remember was something like, it was something like caving into sleep. And, he, and you said to me, caving into sleep. He just kept saying it, caving into sleep. <laughs> and I was just kind of collapsing into this very small thing. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and this sort of squeak came out of me, like the Sybil of Kumai. This sort of squeak came <laughs> out saying, um, and it's not very good really, is it? <laughs> uh, he said, uh, no, it's terrific. The rest is shit. <laughs> <laughs> and next to me there was Bobby who'd wanted to be an artist but his, dr <laughs> his dreams were shattered as well <laughs> um, maybe, maybe just to briefly go back to the, um, the teaching thing because here you know we have this terrific department here in Essex but there's two or three other very strong departments for writing for writing poetry in this country and, and in the United States, there are about 7,000. Yeah. Uh, now, when I went to the USA for the first time, which was also the first time I met you, um, I was a little skeptical, of, and, and, and everyone around me in the UK was skeptical about the teaching of poetry. And, uh, of course, all over the newspapers, there still are. Mm -hmm. um, of course, my experience with you changed that completely for me, but um, I have always regarded it as a bit, a, bit of, a bit of spectacularly fortunate traveling on my part. You know, um, now th uh, the creative writing program sprouting everywhere here, as well as in the U.S. and Canada and so on. And um, I just wonder what you th what you think about it, wh um, how you think it will evolve, if it, if that's happening already, if poetry is changing as a result of it. Um, creative writing is great in the sense that everyone should practice it. Uh, also. Not everyone in a creative writing class is a poet, but what it does do is it increases your sense of syntax, it increases your sense of logic, um, your awareness of bullshit and, and prose or poetry, so that the class is itself a valuable thing to have in any culture, that they should have classes for writing. The genius who is in the class, such as you were, or maybe are still, um, is a freak that happens usually in a writing class. Out of 10 or 12 people, there is one who is genuinely a poet. Now, I'm not saying that negatively. I'm saying that the other people who have come close to writing a very good poem or even writing a good poem are doing great things for themselves and for the culture that you come from. I think it should be something that should be taught in every school because it clarifies logic, it makes things sensible, sensitive, and more real. If we have a culture of poets, there's a thing that Pound wrote that can be taken two ways. The, uh, the, I think the fear of what America would be like if the classics had a wide circulation Troubles my sleep. That's beautiful. <laughs> but I used to think it should be taken negatively, but I think of it now sometimes optimistically. Think of it as an optimistic wish, wish statement. The thought of what America would be like if the classics had a wide circulation. Troubles my sleep with the restlessness of the hope. That is also one way of reading it not the fact of the horror of what would happen if the classics had a wide <laughs> circulation. So there's that aspect of Pound that is there. What great prose writers owe to poetry, for instance, most particularly in Hemingway, is how much he has learned from poetry, even if um, he himself was not a poet. Hemingway, Hemingway wrote a great couplet, and in the end, the age was handed the sort of shit that it demanded. That's wonderful <laughs> in terms of time and so on. But the, the prose of Hemingway depends a lot on a sense of poetry, complete sense of poetry in terms of the precision of choosing the word that is written and also a sense of light that is communicated through working in verse, physical light so that it's a useful thing in any culture. 
to have classes in writing, just as there were classes in rhetoric and so on in the old days and so on. But the equivalent of what we have now is possible there. As for the verse itself, I think, I think that verse is in terrible shape. I think the fact that the teaching of verse is anarchic and not obedient, uh, not hom homage is not paid, that there's no sense of ancestry, particularly in America, uh, because it's the, poetry is not democratic. If it were democratic, there wouldn't be a hierarchy. I'd be as good as Dante. I'm not. So there is that hierarchy. And the aim of trying to ascend in the hierarchy is perfectly legitimate. Ambition in verse, perfectly legitimate. It's part of the nature of the verse, to have that competitive. The, competi the competition is not a competition for fame. It's a competition for truth, in a sense, that goes on. We t touched on this a little bit uh, in, in various ways. I suppose I was thinking about whether over, the, over time your conception of what it is to be a poet has changed. So, you know, the, the poets are on public themes in, in the latest book. There's two that are, about, are re related to Obama and so on. There are pub the public and the private seem very, um, very fused together in, in White Egrets. But you, you, you know, I'm thinking of a poem about the Gulf where you touch upon historic, uh, historical events um, the news, you, you keep up with things, you're not that sort of, sort of solitary poet of the hills, you keep up with things, you read the papers, you know what's going on. It's like uh, the, th the famous thing McNeese said about I would have a poet, you know, sort of um, fond of a drink and fond of the newspapers and all this sort of thing that in fact was a description of McNeese. But uh, I, was, I was wondering what your description of what a poet should be, would be like and, and, and how that's evolved um, from, from the first book to now. I believe poet is a sacred vessel, uh, that a poet carries the conscience of the race, everything Shelley believes in, I believe in. I believe that, especially in terms of crisis, if you look at the history of the conducts of poets in revolutions, in wars, that they don't want to be heroes, but poetry makes them heroic. Uh, you know, people who have been in concentration camps writing, in the last war that we had and have written some, I mean, for instance, a poem by, what's the one, Death, Ceylon. Ceylon's poem is beautiful, desolately beautiful. And he's writing it in the middle of a concentration camp. Uh, <clears throat> Why does that happen? Because there is something stronger than a war, which he knows when he writes it. And this is admirable to have. In countries have had not, that have not had this experience, poetry may not count for very much, like in America, for instance, you know. But ask any European what poetry means, and they'll answer you. Yeah. Also, in, in terms of um, the, the sense of the, the, the public, what's going on in the world, and then what's going on in one's own mind, one's own heart, and so on, There's, that also. I'm thinking of a, 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 a poem that I, f I feel kind of central, like Light of the World, where, where you're, you're discussing what it, well, you're, you're, you're expressing the strange fissure, the strange sense that you are a spokesman for people, that you are, that you are the voice of the tribe, and yet your calling has called you away from them. Um, and that any poet has to be singular, that you, you want to, to be anything as a poet, you have to be able to tap into you, the universal, and yet you isolate yourself to do that, and you don't live a, a normal life. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you still feel that way? Do you still feel that, 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 um, that, that sort of fracture between being part of it yeah. and being, looking, looking at it from a distance? I'll tell it in another way, though. It's the same thing. When I was awarded the Nobel Prize, we had a big ceremony in the Central Park of the Castries. But it started to rain, so we moved into the cathedral. All of this is going on, I'm in the middle of it, and I don't really feel part of it. I'm just looking at this guy being taken here and taken there, and so on and so on. I'm not pretending I'm not moved. But there was a guy outside on a bicycle going round and round in the rain saying, in Creole, 
Moi, ça ne pas ça y est, mais moi, content. I don't know what it is, but I'm happy. <laughs> that's, a, that's an emblem for me. Oh, <laughs> Uh, so that is what I feel in terms of an achievement. They may not know what I do. Naturally, they don't read verses that's so complicated. Some guy, you know, I used to tell people that uh, St. Lucia is so literate that when you came there, you'd see guys cutting cane to the rhythm of the waistline, like April is a cruelest. <laughs> that's, that's the kind of guy we had. <laughs> literate peasant. Anyway. Um, I think that I feel very moved by my location, even if it may be looked at as backward or illiterate or so on. I've seen greater stuff there than some of the great cities of the world, you know, in terms of feeling, etc. So I feel very placed there. I'm okay. Um, maybe we should end with something from the younger generation. Will you read two more poems, please? Now, I feel a bit fractured. I, I was hoping you were about to open that book again. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm sure they were, too. <laughs> no, I'd like to hear. Right, well, I, I'll read one if you'll read okay, one. Right. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I've learned over a quarter of a century how to manipulate him a little bit, so. Um, I'll, re I'll, read this, uh, I'll read this poem because of the rain, and which is, uh, going to be even worse tomorrow, by the way. Um, this is a, called The Flood Towns, and it's about, um, when I was teaching in Massachusetts, uh, it was about the Swift Reservoir, which is an enormous reservoir that gives Boston its drinking water. They had to move four villages completely, um, evacuate them and get rid of them to make the dam, to make the um, reservoir. Uh, so this is about that, uh, The Flood Towns. At the midnight of the August day appointed, a thousand or so remaining inhabitants of the doomed towns popped champagne at the abrupt cessation of town business, of community in any legal sense, the last agreement being that spree till two o'clock when all at once car headlamps lit the hillside. And in the morning, those who had been ready were gone, leaving behind eight ragged families with nowhere else to be. And these it would have been who heard the very first tinkering of rain upon the rooftops, or saw its fingers spot the windows, sniffed it through the door, opened to save the washing. And perhaps it did sound different, the rain this time, not because it was fiercer, more aware than former rain, but because it fell for hours in the hearing of folk who knew none in heaven or earth with any stake in stopping it. sea change. With a change of government, the permanent cobalt, the promises we take with a pinch of salt. With a change of government, the permanent aquamarine. With a reorganized cabinet, the permanent violet. The permanent lilac over the reef, the permanent flux of ochre shallows, the torn bunting of the currents, and the receding banners of the breakers. With a change in government, no change in the crickets chirrup, the low comical bellow of the bull, or the astonishing symmetry of tossing horses. With a change in government, the haze of wide rain, which you begin to hear as a ruler hears the crowd gathering under the balcony, the leader who was promised the permanent cobalt of a change of government with the lilac and violet of the cabinet's change. Thank you very much for the evening.
This is like play melancholy, baby. <laughs> a far cry from Africa. <laughs> a wind is ruffling the tawny pelt of Africa. Kikuyu, quick as flies, batten upon the bloodstreams of the veldt. Corpses are scattered through a paradise. Only the worm, kernel of carrion, cries, waste no compassion on these separate dead. Statistics justify and scholars seize the salience of colonial policy. What is that to the white child hacked in bed, to savages expendable as Jews? Threshed out by beakers, the long rushes break in a white dust of ibises whose cries have wheeled since civilization's dawn from the parched river or beast teeming plain. The violence of beast on beast is read as natural law, but upright man seeks his divinity by inflicting pain. Delirious as these worried beasts, his wars dance to the tightened carcass of a drum, while he calls courage still that native dread of the white peace contracted by the dead. Again, brutish necessity wipes its hands upon the napkin of a dirty cause. Again, a waste of our compassion as with Spain, the gorilla wrestles with the Superman. I who am poisoned with the blood of both, where shall I turn, divided to the vein? I who have cursed the drunken officer of British rule, how choose between this Africa and the English tongue I love? Betray them both or give up what they give. How can I face such slaughter and be cool? How can I turn from Africa and live? Thank you. Thank you. Are you getting off?